Hello, everyone. I am Kristen Miller Zone, Curator of Collections and Exhibitions at the Lauren Rogers Museum of Art in Laurel, Mississippi. And today I am speaking with AJ Smith. This is part of a series of videos that we are doing about artists whose work we have collected for our permanent collection in the last few years. And I'm thrilled today to be speaking with AJ Smith. AJ, could you please just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your background? Good morning, Christian. Thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this project. Of course, uh, it allows me to not only speak to my public, but also to the public of the Lauren Rogers Museum. Uh, as an artist, I see my work as a means of communicating my idea of thought with uh, the general public. Of course, I will give you a general idea of how I got started. Of course, uh, I was born in Jonestown, Mississippi, uh, located in Cahoma County, the northern part of Mississippi. Uh, it is directly south of Memphis, Tennessee, on what has become the Blues Highway, Highway 61. And in Jonestown, it was fairly small, small community uh, with very little outside access to cultural activities. I remember my first major museum visit was when I was about 18 years old uh, after moving to Kansas City. I visited the Nelson Gallery of Art in Kansas City. Of course, I felt I could see the artist's work and meet the artist of centuries ago, face to face. Of course, I was always interested in art, even as uh, a kid in what was then segregated public schools. This is well after 1954 Brown versus Board of Education, but Mississippi was a little bit uh, slow in catching up with things but we were patient knowing that it would eventually happen. I attended high school and after finishing high school, I moved to Kansas City and attended the Kansas City Art Institute at the insistence of my high school art teacher, Mr. Joseph Gooden, whom I still keep in touch with and send him announcements on everything that I've been doing over the past nearly 50 years. After finishing undergraduate school at the Kansas City Art Institute, I had the intentions of working for a while, earning a little bit of money to pay for graduate school. Of course, I, I spent a year working earning a little bit of money and had a lot of fun. At the end of that year, enrolled in graduate school, wondering how will I pay for this? But all worked out and after two years of graduate school, I met Robert Blackburn, Bob Blackburn of the printmaking workshop. Uh, Bob Blackburn is a master artist who was extremely instrumental in allowing me to move forward and continue my practice in the arts. After living in New York City for nearly nine years, I was invited to serve as artist in residence at the Arkansas Arts Center in Little Rock, Arkansas, where I have lived for the past nearly 40 years. My artwork continues to be about communicating with people. And I am working on a series of images now, which I call my Faces of the Delta series, where I visit locations in the Mississippi and Arkansas Delta. Uh, the young man that 
we are looking at here is, is entitled Boy from Jonestown. I was doing my research, meeting people, walking around, and this kid had uh, come up to town to, I don't know, buy some candy or to run an errand for his mother. And he was curious what I was doing. So I took the time and talked with him. As I looked at this kid and I could see myself at nine or 10 years old. I mean, that was me. So I wanted to give him as much information about what I was doing as I possibly could because I felt I was talking to myself. And hopefully this kid will pick up the baton once I am no longer able, once I am no longer able to carry this baton and run with it. The image that you're looking at now is a silver point drawing the title Boy from Jonestown, part of my Faces of the Delta series. For this image, I chose to do it in silver point because of the degree of detail that is possible when one is drawn with silver point. Now, silver point is a traditional method uh, that predates the graphite pencil. Uh, artists such as Raphael, Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo Brunati, uh, that period of artists used silver point because graphite was not available until the, about the middle part of the 16th century. In this drawing, born from Jonestown, I focus on the texture of his hair, the texture of his skin, and the intensity of his stare. And I, I feel that uh, a medium like Silver Point allows one to do that. So uh, haphazardly, while I was in Jonestown, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, working on my Faces of the Delta series, he shows up, was curious about what I was doing and therefore, I saw an opportunity because in his face, I could see myself at his age and therefore recording him was like recording my thoughts when I was as curious as he was at that time when I was nine or 10 years old. Now this image is titled Heir to a Governor. It is a civil point drawing. In this drawing, again, I chose to use civil point because of the degree of fine detail it permits, much finer detail than I am able to get with graphite pencil. My images, I feel, tell a story. I'm trying to tell a story. And this image titled Heir to a Governor, this is the great grandson of former Governor James Lusk Alcorn of Mississippi. Governor Alcorn served as the governor of the state of Mississippi. He served as a congressman of the state of Mississippi, as well as a general on the Confederate side during the Civil War. As a kid, of course, one of my summer jobs, 15, 16 years old, was to cut the grass on the family grave site where Governor James Luss Alcorn, the former Governor James Luss Alcorn was the, was the centerpiece of that grave mound. As a kid, if you will bear with me here, my images are all about a story. As a kid, living in Mississippi, I do remember that when Black people wanted to approach the wealthy landowner, one had to stand on the ground at the back door. However, working on my series, I arranged a meeting with the great-grandson of Governor Alcorn, 
because I wanted to invite him to be part of my Faces of the Delta series. He agreed. The deputy sheriff of Cahoma County served as the intermediary setting up the appointment. So in 2011, when I met with him as part of my research, I realized that life takes the strangest of turns. Here we are, the great grandson of the governor, talking about his past, knowing that our path moved in completely different directions with no indication at all that we would have such a meeting. We sat for well over two hours visiting. And for a while, his wife, Mrs. Russell, came into the room and sat with us. Our meeting started about 11.30 in the morning on a Saturday morning. Right about 1.30 or 2 o'clock, Mrs. Russell's indicated that it was time for her afternoon nap. And therefore she retired to take her afternoon nap. Of course, uh, if you would bear with me here, that just left, as one would say in Mississippi, the men folk in the room. I looked above his doorway and there was a rifle on a rifle hook a rifle rack above the doorway. So I inquired about that rifle. Mr. Russell was silent for a moment. And then he commented, that rifle is why we lost the war, referring to the Civil War. He said, those Yankee boys had repeating compression rifles while all we had was muzzle loaders and the rifle above his door was a yankee compression rifle so that led to another conversation he realized my interest in his firearms of course i was only interested in that rifle and then he asked me if i would like to see the rest of his collection if in the vernacular of the time, a Southern gentleman asks you if you want to see his gun collection. You're friends now. You are friends 100%. If he brings out his gun collection dating back to the 1860s to let you take a look at it. We had a fantastic conversation. This piece is all about the meeting of two different cultures that had occupied the same space for many years. So you got to you got to see his faith for a really long time that day and kind of very study it very well. And that brings up a question when you actually then went to create the piece were you working from your memory or did you have photographs of him to look at? How do you generally work when you make these portraits? Well, we had a very long visit, so I could make some quick sketches uh, because memory fails you sometimes you know, as far as detail. I could make some quick sketches and I took uh, a number of photographs from different angles and different lights while we were talking. We spent several hours together that Saturday late morning into the early afternoon. Uh, and so when I was working on the piece, I brought all of my research material, my sketches, my photographs, and my, my memory of the conversation, and even photographs I found of him and his father in public domain, as well as memories of what my father had told me about them during my father's childhood. So I brought all of that back into my studio. And over a period of time, 
I worked on the drawing. Uh, drawing is a very contemplated process. Uh, memories will present themselves to your conscious awareness that you never realized were there. So a lot of those memories came back as I was working on the drawing. And when I finally finished the drawing, I made a digital copy of it exactly the same size and mailed it to his wife, Mrs. Russell. Of course, uh, sometimes later, we had an opportunity to talk on the phone and I learned that she was not very enamored of the drawing. Uh, and in conversation, I discovered why. Uh, she told me that I made him look so old. Well, he was in his mid nineties when I met him again and we were talking. So, I mean, he looks like a gentleman who is in very good shape, but nonetheless, in his mid 90 years old. So, uh, and I was, I was surprised that she thought I made him look so old. But, I think he looks distinguished. Yes, yes. But uh, some years later, she finally was able to track me down through mutual acquaintances uh, and asked that I called her. So I telephoned her and uh, this was maybe five years or six years after I completed the drawing and had sent her a copy of it. Uh, and she talked to me about the drawing and she absolutely loved the drawing then. Well, five years later, she learned to love this drawing. This is Eddie, graphite pencil, uh, the same size, 46 by 36 inches. Now, Eddie is part of my Faces of the Delta Way Down South series. Uh, I jumped on my motorcycle, rode down to Jonestown, Mississippi, which is maybe three to three and a half hours away, and riding around looking for subjects. And this young man was standing there talking to a woman in a wheelchair. And so as I was passing by, I stopped and nodded to them. And the woman in the wheelchair said, AJ, is that you? Well, I completely stopped and I realized it was someone from my childhood. She remembered me, I mean, for, you know, I will date myself now, but she remembered me from 60 years ago. So apparently there was something about me that she recognized. Once I stopped, I recognized her. I don't have an image of uh, the woman I'm refer referring to now, but it was Geraldine. Uh, eventually I did a drawing of Geraldine. At any rate, Geraldine introduced me to Eddie who was standing beside her. And Eddie was wearing his cap and his hood or pullover. At that time, the Trayvon Martin case was front page news in the newspaper, as well as all of the news talk shows. I looked at Eddie and I saw Trayvon Martin. I could imagine this was what Trayvon Martin looked like when he was walking home from the convenience store that evening with his hoodie pulled over his head to keep out the chill. Now, a young black man walking along, wearing a hoodie just to keep out the chill should not ordinarily be assumed to be a threat. When I saw Eddie and and there was a brisk chill in the air that morning. It was maybe 9.30 or 10 o'clock in the morning and the temperature was maybe 40 to 45 degrees. Of course, too cold to ride a motorcycle, but nonetheless, 
uh, there I was. Eddie reminded me of all that I had seen and read of Trayvon Martin, a young man wearing a hoodie just to keep out the chill, lost his life. When I look at this piece, this is what I see. Thank you, AJ. It's a, it's a gorgeous image and a really moving story of how it was produced. You and I met when you were part of an exhibition at the Lauren Rogers Museum of Art that we co-curated with Hannah Israel of Columbus State University in Georgia. It was a metal point show and I am proud to say that we collected this piece for the Lauren Rogers Museum of Arts collection from that show, Benny Brown, A Silver Point. Can you tell us a little bit about this piece? Benny Brown, uh, first I will tell you a little bit about Benny Brown. Uh, Benny Brown is a childhood friend. Uh, he was what uh, I would consider one of my circle of friends when I was maybe third or fourth grade. Uh, I was maybe a grade ahead of him. He's maybe a year, two years younger than I. Uh, during my series, Business in Jonestown, Mississippi, uh, many of the people that I knew in grade school are still living there. Benny Brown and I we met and we talked at a fantastic conversation. At that time, he was a grocer, had a store in Jonestown, Mississippi. Uh, he has lost the store now because the town is virtually closed down. There was a mobile bank directly across the street from the store that Benny Brown had. And the mobile bank packed up and moved. There is no bank in the town now, and there is little to no industry at all, other than the casino, which is maybe uh, 30 or 40 miles north of Jonestown. Benny Brown and I talked uh, about things necessary to improve the community, at least to postpone the death of the community. Biddy Brown is now a lay minister preaching the gospel, trying to get people to join him in his effort to postpone the death of Jonestown. And in talking with Benny Brown, I see in him all that he is trying to do to save the community that he was born into and grew up in. I was born into the, that community, but from the time I was a little kid, uh, my parents, my parents' friends, and my grandparents would say, when you grow up, you must leave here if you want to do something. That is unfortunate. That is unfortunate. During the 50s, the 60s, and even in the 1970s and into the 80s, young Black people were encouraged to leave from the time they entered grade school. Most of us did leave. Unfortunately, I was one of those who left, but I'm close to going back. I'm only three and a half hours away, but that's a lifetime ago. Benny Brown still continues to postpone the death of the community. And for that reason, I had to include Benny Brown in my Faces of the Delta series. And thank you for giving Benny Brown a permanent home. I must say 
Benny Brown has visited the Lauren Rogers Museum because he knows his image is in there. He's part of our family now too. Yes, we, thank you. We, we chose this one in particular from, from the works that you had in the exhibition because we thought it really showed off what silver point as a technique could do in terms of the detail, the surface detail and, and the compositional um, depth that you're able to get with this. And we particularly loved the, the texture in his straw hat and the reflections that you can see in his glass lenses. Yeah. See, uh, some of my images of silver point uh, I also work with watercolor, with graphite, lithography and etching, uh, and all painting. Uh, each image speaks its own language. It can talk about the same thing, but the medium used has its own language. Uh, of course, I'm not a writer, but I've talked to writers. There are writers who will say that uh, their words, messages, and meanings communicated through a particular language that cannot be accurately and truthfully translated into a different language. You can only get a general facsimile of what it means through the translation. And with artwork, I feel this the same way. I feel that there are things I can say in the image of Silver Point that cannot be uh, clearly spoken in graphite, pencil, vice versa. There are some things that must be stated in lithography. There are some things that must be stated in watercolor. See, if I look at a Rembrandt Van Ryn oil painting, when I was in New York, I would visit the painting Aristotle contemplating the bust of Homer all of the time. I can see Rembrandt in every stroke of his paintbrush. And there is a language that can only be spoken in that word. I mean, in that medium. And with the silver point of Benny Brown, it had to be a silver point in this image. Of Miss Daisy Bates, Silver Point of Benny Brown, it had to be in Silver Point. With this image of Miss Daisy Gatson Bates, it had to be lithography. I visited with Miss Bates on a Saturday morning, uh, shortly after I moved to Little Rock, Arkansas. I had read about and heard much about of Miss Bates and the Little Rock Nine, and what Miss Bates represented trying to integrate Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas, under the governorship of Orable Fathers. And when I moved to Little Rock, uh, I had only read about her in the newspaper, including her husband's uh, newspapers, hers and her husband's newspapers. So I picked up the telephone and made a cold call, you know. Uh, she answered her own phone. Uh, although she had an assistant, she answered her own phone. And I introduced myself on the phone and told her uh, that I was very much interested in meeting her and talking with her about her activity. And I was an artist and I wanted to include her uh, as one of my subjects in my artwork. She agreed. So, we scheduled an appointment and I went over on the Saturday morning. Again, we visited all morning into the early afternoon, uh, listening to her stories while I was making sketches. When I saw her, I saw her as a lithograph using the, tra the traditional image, medium and methods for lithography as developed in 1798 using Bavarian limestone as the surface upon which the drawing would be made. And there is a texture in the drawing that I feel represents 
the texture of who she is, of her face, of her skin, of her glasses, the light reflecting in the glasses, the texture of her hair. So she had to be a lithograph. And we talked for hours as I took photographs and made sketches. You were speaking about some of the other media that you use. Here's a gorgeous watercolor. Can you tell us about this one? This is uh, <clears throat> Miss Cora Amons. Miss Cora uh, made quilts. I mean, the hand made quilt using the saddle stitch, the, the traditional way of saddle stitching by hands and a metal thimble on her fingers. Uh, so one of my friends, uh, an attorney here in Little Rock, asked if I would do a drawing of his mother-in-law for his wife and her grandkids. And he wanted it to be done as a lithograph. Yes, uh, he had seen the drawing of Miss Daisy Bates as lithograph. So I did a lithograph of Miss Cora, but I felt the image was not complete as, as a lithograph. It did not communicate uh, the person I saw. So I did a smaller watercolor of Miss Cora that was close close to what I wanted to do, a smaller watercolor, six by four and a half inches, very small. This image is 20 by 16, I believe. So I wanted to do a larger watercolor of Miss Cora. So I visited with her at her home and uh, her son-in-law brought her to my studio and we had a long visit. So I did a watercolor of Miss Cora, 16 by 20 inches. And I didn't think it worked very well. So I did another watercolor of Miss Cora, same size. It didn't work very well either. So I did a third image of Miss Cora, watercolor. When I completed the third image, I said, that's her. That's it. So I brought Marjorie into my studio. Again, she's also an artist. And she looked at the three watercolors I had done of Miss Cora. And the first thing she said, they all look the same. I said, no, no, no. But the third one is different. I mean, it's more of her. And she said, no, they are all exactly the same. Well. Now, I only have two of those watercolor images now. Uh, a collector has the other one. I can't tell the difference between them now. They all look the same to me as Marjorie said they look the same then. This is a <clears throat> lithograph monoprint uh, titled The Uncivil War. Well, for one thing, I don't think anything is, is civil about war. War is not a civil activity. <laughs> it's a very belligerent activity. There's nothing civil about it. So this is entitled the Uncivil War. The Mosaic Temple Us Cultural Center here in Little Rock, Arkansas, commissioned me to do this piece. They wanted artwork that represented the participation or at least some type of involvement of African-Americans in the Civil War. During my research, of course, I hadn't thought about the Civil War since high school. I didn't think about it very much then, but nonetheless, it was part of the history required. During my research, I learned so much about the incivility I mean, the brutality of the Civil War. I mean, it is absolutely incredible. S wounded soldiers were left on the battlefield. They lay there dying. And I hate to say this, but it's absolutely atrocious. 
scavenging animals would visit the battlefields and feed on the soldiers before they passed. I mean, that's absolutely incredible. This is the Civil War. And commanders would meet and come to agreement of when they would meet and what battlefield they would meet on. And they would line up across from each other and just fire upon each other. I mean, that is, I mean, there is nothing more uncivil than that. That's the Civil War. And African-Americans participated in the Civil War on both sides. The great-grandson heir to a governor, father, James Los Alcorn, was one of the commanding generals in the Civil War. This piece is all about that. I mean, capturing a prisoner of war. I mean, it's reported that many African-Americans who fought in the war when they were captured, they were lynched on the battlefield. This piece represents an African-American, or I should say it, it represents all of the African-Americans who fought in the Civil War, who were lynched on the battlefield. No such thing as an African-American prisoner of war. They were lynched on the battlefield. These are soldiers that participated in that. Uh, the drawings of the soldiers was done from photographs, obviously, done from photographs. And these were some of the soldiers who actually fought in the Civil War. They were African-American Arkansans who actually fought in the Civil War. I present here only two of the sketches that was part of that commission piece. It is a, a sextet, you know, a series of six images uh, meant to be read from left to right. And they are all uh, 48 by 38 inches. And this is my version of the uncivil war, if there's any such thing as the war being civil. And this this piece, these works, are part of an exhibition that is opening yeah. soon. Will you tell us about that? Okay. Uh, this diptych that I have of the un uncivil war, it is an exhibition uh, July 1st through August 31st at the Arkansas Governor's Mansion. Uh, because of the COVID-19 restrictions, uh, the exhibition is only available uh, as virtual access, which uh, I will post today. The exhibition was hung uh, the last week of June and uh, for the Governor's Mansion activities, of course, I was told that the Attorney General and several congressmen from both sides of the aisle would be visiting the, visiting the governor's mansion and they would uh, be visiting during the time when Marjorie is my wife and my work was up, up well, will be up. And so uh, a lot of eyes will be on it. Once the, the virtual exhibition becomes available, uh, scheduled this afternoon. Uh, it will be available on Facebook as well as my website and uh, anyone who visits the Governor's Mansion website. Great, and I'll, I'll post a link too, also when I post this video, so they'll be all together. Oh, AJ, thanks. thank you so much for speaking with us today. I truly appreciate it. It's been wonderful to hear these stories and to see the work, even if we have to do it virtually and not in person. So thank you very much. Well, there's one thing about the virtual activity. You see, uh, I have learned to be thankful for all things. 
uh, this is one thing my father taught me, be thankful for all things. And COVID-19 is absolutely devastating. However, there will be good in everything to come out of this. Like there is a lot of good that has come from George Floyd's death. His death was a tragedy, but there is a lot of good that continues to evolve because of that. COVID-19 has made us much more aware of the virtual access available to us. And because of this, hopefully, of when, not if, but when the vaccine is developed, the virtual access will become part of museum and art activities or continue to be part of museum and art activities, I should say. So be thankful for all things. Indeed, indeed. Thanks so much, AJ. And you have a great day. Thanks for visiting with me. Thanks, you too.